2022 was a very interesting year for watchmaking. There were definitely some very exciting releases. So in this episode, we're gonna take a look at all of the best watches that came out in 2022. But as I always say, with the good comes the bad, so we're gonna take a look at some of the stinkers as well. So guys, this might be a longer episode, so please grab a snack, sit back, and enjoy best and worst of 2022. Let's go. It is 2.12 p.m. Let's get down to business. Ugh. All right, guys, as always, guess. Guess the watch I'm wearing. We're gonna show you at the end for the wristwatch check, but comment right now if you think you know what's on my wrist. All right, guys, so starting with the best of 2022, this is actually kind of in chronological order as well. We gotta talk about this Cartier. And we can see here from a Hodinky article, oh my God. Oh my god, we're on ho we're on Hodinky! Please don't please please don't f my wife. Please don't f my wife, please. If you don't know what that's referring to, check out this episode, Gato Roll It. I bet you'll see the watch and possibly even the person in a different light. They're cucks. <laughs> anyway, the Cartier Masse Mysterious. I'm probably butchering that name, but this is an insane watch. So here with these artsy fartsy photos. Uh, might just look like a Cartier that is, you know, skeletonized. They always do these mysterious dial watches where it looks like uh, everything is see-through and transparent. And how does the watch even work? Well, there are some gizmos here. Is that, is, th is this, is this a gizmo? Well, what's insane about this Cartier specifically is that the rotor is the movement. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, yeah, the, the rotor is always on the movement. No, 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 no. You've, mis you've misunderstood. The rotor is the movement. All right, so this right here is the counterweight that will move freely, which winds the movement that is sitting within the rotor. It is a absolutely nuts feat of watchmaking one of the coolest watches I've ever seen, and definitely one of the best releases of 2022, hands down. Here we go with another Cartier. These are tanks, and I know what you're saying. Oh, well, a Cartier tank is kind of just a fashion watch. And yeah, I get it. They're not the most technologically advanced, complicated, crazy watches, but they're elegant and literally probably one of the first wrist watches ever and uh you cannot deny the fact that cartier yes makes some more jewelry-esque items uh fashion savvy items but are also one of the trailblazers and and again probably one of the fathers of wrist-worn timepieces period so uh, I absolutely love the Cartier tank. You know I have a Musta Cartier tank. You know that my dad has a uh, tank Solo XL, I believe. Um, so we're big Cartier fans here in the Goodman household. But um, yeah, these are awesome. Incredibly dynamic dial without being super complicated or busy. Almost art deco. You're getting the Roman numerals. You're getting that sapphire gemstone on the crown. And if you don't like red, you have this kind of black slate dial. Uh, just incredibly elegant. Again, one of my favorite releases of 2022. Now we can't bring up 2022 watch releases without mentioning the reissue of the prolific 2022. No, wait, 222. It is the year 2022. This episode might be coming out in 2023. I just pissed my pants a little bit. The Vacheron Constantin. 222, this is essentially a reissue, a little bit different, but pretty much the same from the original Proto Overseas. Now, why do I say Proto Overseas? Well, it's because this is the watch that had to come out before Vacheron came out with the Overseas, which again, the Overseas is the contender uh, that fights against the Nautilus and the Royal Oak, even though clearly the Overseas is the better watch, but whatever. Blah, 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 blah. This is the kind of integrated bracelet, industrial design we see with this one, a gorgeous display case back, minimally decorated, but again, still very, very impressive and clean. This is an awesome retro watch. Um, but again, for me, it's, it's pretty much unobtainium, but it's, it's 
got to be one of my favorite releases of 2022 because this is pretty much one of my favorite Vacherons of all time. But hey, what do I know? Look at that. It's literally like a gold bar on your wrist. Like, I have a, a president, but this, uh, man, this is just next level. Sleek, industrial, sharp, lays flat on the wrist. <sighs> if I have to get an integrated bracelet, like hyper luxury watch, I almost said sports watch, but you know, this it is essentially a sports watch. Um, th this would have to be it. Like even over and overseas, I would pick this for sure. I'm not going to spend too much time with this one, even though this is a great release, the JLC Polaris. Uh, this one is in gold, highly complicated. Uh, we can see that they gave a Polaris a perpetual calendar, and um, I thought it was very interesting and sleek and, and, and cool. Again, if you've seen one Polaris, I guess you can say you've seen them all, but still, this is one of the coolest sports watches on the market, in my opinion, and it's very, very underrated in JLC, even though they are probably one of the most proficient, impressive Swiss luxury watchmakers. Uh, for some reason, people don't mention them as much as they should, so uh, I had to put on the list. Great release. Absolutely incredible release. Uh, for 2022. Vacheron had to make the list again uh, because this salmon dial watch is just insane. Um, highly complicated. Uh, we can see you're getting a triple date. You're getting a moon phase. Uh, this is, again, salmon chronograph. Uh, here's the thing with this watch. This is what I would consider to be a direct competitor to the Longa data graph not just any data graph the perpetual tourbillon again salmon with white gold uh i don't know who did it better gato put put these two pictures up against each other this or this hmm the longa does look great and it is a data graph something about this vacheron man and that let me see if i can enhance that look at that that very cool plate moon phase uh it's it's I love it. This ha this has to be one of my favorite. This is the traditional perpetual calendar chronograph. Um, I'm actually not totally confident about the material. Let me see. Ooh, platinum. Okay. So this is actually a platinum case watch, uh, whereas the Longa is, I believe, white gold. Um, so to be perfectly honest, I actually do prefer white gold over platinum, but uh, I know that people are going to just freak out because platinum is platinum. Oh, no, my God. Oh. And I couldn't put that Vacheron on the list unless we move to this Patek Philippe. Uh, this is also Salmon. Again, This is they're just all competing with each other at this point. I'm happy to see more Salmon dial watches on the market because uh, although I don't personally own a Salmon dial watch, it's probably one of my favorite uh, dial colors. So, so this release from Patek is the Perpetual Calendar 5320 and the Chronograph 5172. This is the Chronograph. This is... Uh, the perpetual calendar. You can see very, very nice salmon. This almost looks a little bit more matte than the last Vacheron we took a look at. I really, really, really love the stepped cut here uh, on the borders. This has a less interesting moon phase, but still, I mean, gorgeous. I do like their use of matte slate bordering on the Arabics and on the handset. Uh, I just think it, it's it's a very nice combination, very nice contrast, not too flashy, definitely a more subtle watch uh, than that Vacheron, but you know, we're gonna talk about Patek a little bit later when we're talking about the stinkers, so gotta give them credit where credit's due, this is a great release. Now we spoke about the kind of retro fun that came out with the uh, re-release of the Vacheron 222, but let's take it even further back with this uh, essentially reimagining of a very vintage Omega, al almost like an Omega jumbo with like a uh, sector dial. This is the Omega CK859. We can see it's kind of a big boy on the wrist, but you cannot deny this very old school Omega font with the old school Omega logo. Literally looks like it was just painted on. Uh, and then that handset blued. I am getting a text message. People shouldn't be texting me when I'm working. But this might be one of my favorite watches on the list, honestly. I, I think that I, I am such a sucker for vintage Omegas. And again, that's, that's pretty much, I don't want to say it's my specialty at the shop, but pretty much every reissue or restock, excuse me, we get 
uh, at least one vintage Omega. I think we sold two during the Black Friday sale. Um, so I, I, I have a um, soft spot in my heart for for vintage Omegas, especially well done, well kept ones. Uh, and th I mean, this is a modern made rendition of a vintage Omega. So this is pretty much as clean as you can get uh, the CK release. Absolutely gorgeous. Look at this display case back with that movement. Here's something you won't see with any of the uh, vintage Omegas that I sell the Time Teller shop. You are not going to get this level of decoration on the case back. Look at that. Absolutely gorgeous. Omega, as, as, as much as, as us watch collectors love Omega, I still think they are kind of the underdog. Most people pay attention to Rolex, but... Uh, I think in, in many cases, Omega probably makes better watches and more interesting watches for sure. Hey, 6,500 bucks. That's not bad. Okay. So this next watch, I didn't know if I wanted to put on the best or worst, uh, because it is something I absolutely would purchase and is right up my alley, but it's frustrating because of Hamilton being Hamilton. What do I mean by that? Well, this is an absolutely great military-esque, essentially, reissue of a pilot's chronograph. They do a great job whenever they're doing these, you know, military watches. You can't think military watch without also thinking Hamilton. Uh, gorgeous cushion case um, with this nice crown that's recessed a tiny bit and then these pushers that push out. Um... It's it's just a very, very nice uh, silhouette of a functional chronograph, right? This one, uh, let's see, recreation of a specific 1970s era Hamilton pilot's watch used by the RAF. Now, I have a soft spot for RAF Hamiltons because of my 9721 RAF limited edition, which is the LL Bean Dial uh, Hamilton. That's actually my first automatic watch I ever owned. I got it when I was eight years old. This has a, let's see, 60 hour power reserve. Very, very impressive. I also think it has a 10 atmosphere water resistance rating. Yep, 100 meters. Very, very cool. Here's my issue. Hamilton being Hamilton is not going to give us like mechanical chronographs at all unless you're paying over two grand. That's that's just it. I thought that they were going to release this at like 2,500. So seeing this at 2045, that's, you know, I guess better than 25, but still would have loved to see this at like the 750 mark, I feel like, but, but you know, they're, that's wishful thinking to say the least. Speaking of underdogs, because I said the Omega is an underdog, which is which is probably a bizarre statement to many watch enthusiasts because they're like, what? Omega is like the most popular brand ever. Anyway, Glass Huta, probably the best watchmakers ever because they're German. They don't really get the, you know, the, the accolades that they, I think that they deserve because this they make such interesting watches. When we're thinking of German high-end watchmaking, people think of longa uh this is not anywhere in the longa price range uh much more attainable than any longa and i would argue you are getting longa levels of watch uh i don't think that this is anything to scoff at and i definitely don't think that if you put this up next to a longa this would look like rubbish that's not the case this is so it's not symmetrical, right? Glasuta isn't known for making symmetrical watches, neither is Longa. But this is very, very interesting to the eye, incredibly dynamic, not confusing, still very interesting, but not like so wonky that you don't know what's going on. They just make very nice looking watches. You can see kind of a matte dial with very nice stepped cuts. Uh, and then this nice louvered cut into this moon phase. And then with these sub dials here, well, this is the main time telling dial and then the sub seconds, you can see a very nice guilloche ridge pattern. Just absolutely gorgeous. And um, Glasuta is, is one of my favorite watchmakers, period, but definitely uh, perhaps the best German watchmaker in my opinion. Sorry, sorry, Longa. <laughs> Love this watch. Absolutely love it. You can see here, micro rotor, very nice. Uh, not like 
ridiculously decorated, but very, very, very interesting. And there is some, like, the decoration it has is very impressive. That's what I will say. And honestly, I don't know how you, like... Anyone that would look at this and, and wouldn't be impressed, like, what do you want, man? Like, seriously, this is such a gorgeous watch. <whistles> look at that. Awesome. Dude, no, you know what? I would say this is ridiculously decorated. Look at that. Okay, so when I said that this isn't longer levels of money, the, hold on. You can get Panamatic Lunars here. You can see 9,900, 9,900. The platinum cased one, which is partially skeletonized, I guess. Partially skeletonized, excuse me. 150 piece limited edition. That's like $39,000. So there you are in long of money. But, but you can get Panamatic Lunar watches that are still incredibly impressive that look very similar to this for less than 10K. That's all I want to say. Now, who would have thunk... Tudor makes it into my best of. I don't think I've ever put Tudor in the best of as long as I've been on YouTube, but for, mark it in the calendars, guys, for 2022. Tudor made it with the Ranger. Gato, clip it! Most of it is brushed, uh, especially on the flat sides of the case, but then on the edges, there's very nice polished sections, and it just looks, again, like there's a ton of detail and effort put into the watch. It almost makes you feel a little bit reluctant to use this as a field watch because of how nicely the case is finished. I got to spend a decent amount of time with one on the wrist, thanks to one of my channel members, Mike. You got you send it over to me. I got to hang out with it, and it was just a whole lot of fun. It is a very minimal, impressive, great execution on a field watch and everything is very legible very visible the loom was decent um you're getting a lot of a lot of watch honestly i know people say oh it's boring well if you don't like field watches then you don't like field watch i don't know what to tell you but for a cosk 39 millimeter swiss field watch uh with a threaded crown under 3k hey i'll take it and i get it people are going to complain well you know there's a lot of micro brands that are giving us a lot for a lot less and that's true. I think that a lot of what we look at in the big box watch world, we do have to put into perspective micro brands like Boulder, uh, micro brands like Vero, they're giving field watches, or they're giving, they're selling field watches that give us a lot of bang per buck uh, for a lot less money. That's, you know, the Boulder Expedition, right? That's also a field watch, threaded crowns. Great water resistance rating, Swiss movement, and that's, you know, less than $1,000. But if you want something from Tudor, if you want a Ranger uh, under 3K, this is a whole lot of watch. I absolutely loved it. This is definitely one of the best releases of 2022. Now, this is the second to last watch on the list. This, uh, I believe, was I learned about it around September. This Longine is so... Dude, okay. More people need to carve dials. What do I mean by that? Well, a lot of people freak out about applied indexes. They don't like printed dials. They want applied, 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 applied. That adds dynamic, right? It's raised off the top. It casts shadows across the dial. Carve the dial, okay? Grand Seiko did it with, with some of the more rare J14070s. Mine's not a carved dial. Mine has the applied logo. But this has essentially like pseudo breguet arabics that are carved into the dial and it looks so freaking cool now this is celebrating their 190th anniversary this is their master collection you can see here they have a kind of textured uh i refer to this as like an asphalt dial and we're going to talk about that in, in a little bit when we look at the stinkers you can see carved indexes rose gold rose gold handset uh, they did some rose gold. So it literally looks like they carved, like they put asphalt over a rose gold plate and they carved into it, exposing uh, that rose gold from under uh, this kind of harsh, rough dial. The texturing is so nice. Doesn't look like a tech deck. Doesn't look like a tech deck skateboard. They just did such a freaking good job with this master collection. And this is in direct contrast to what Patek did. Uh, earlier this year with literally introducing just some ugly overpriced tech decks. We're going to look at that in a little bit. But this Longines Master Collection, it is so freaking beautiful. Um, you like yellow gold. You have uh, a kind of grained dial. 
um, to look at. I actually prefer just this plain one and the uh, kind of asphalt dial. But moving on, gorgeous watch. It, they do have uh, modified ETA movements, but I mean, it's Swatch Group, so whatever. Love it. Good job. Longine, good job. And last but not least, a watch I very recently came across and reviewed, and I have it right here in front of me. This Timex Expedition North Titanium Automatic Display Case Back Threaded Crown. 200 meter water resistance rating? Let me see, let me see, let me see. Yes! Crazy watch, under $400. I did a review of it, clip it! Look at it, it's like, yes, field watch. But those crown guards and date complication, those aren't the only things that really sets this apart from other field watches. We really need to look at the specs and the sub $350 price tag. Guys, if you don't jump on this watch, you are silly. So guys, there are the best releases of 2022, but I told you this is going to be a bit of a long episode. We got to look at the worst of 2022. Oh my god, Zenith made the list, <laughs> but I love Zenith. Too f***ing bad. Alright, this is seriously the biggest joke on Earth, because Zenith made an homage to a Rolex Daytona, and people got upset when I called it out for being an homage to a Rolex Daytona, because those dumbasses... Uh, we're like, oh, <laughs> you don't know anything. Zenith actually made the first Daytonas. Okay, so there's multiple flaws with that statement. Zenith didn't make any Daytona. Rolex sourced a Zenith movement for some of their Daytonas, but the first Daytonas used a Valjou movement. So what are you trying to say? Also... Just because one watchmaker sources a movement from another watchmaker, unless they have some something written in a contract, doesn't mean that that watchmaker then has rights to make their own copy of that other watch that sourced one of their movements. Like, it, it, none of it makes sense, but Zenith made that stupid El Primero copy of a Daytona, essentially. And then people complained about that, so then they make... A copy of a Royal Oak. It's like Zenith became just an homage watchmaker. They're like an expensive Pagani design. So people are going to say, well, this Zenith Defy Skyline, it's actually just a remake of the original Zenith Defy. So I don't know what I'm talking about, right? Wrong. Because at the beginning of the year, in January, they actually made a reissue of the original Zenith Defy. This is the Zenith Defy, okay? The original Zenith Defy does have an angular case, and it looks exactly like this one, the Defy Revival. The Defy Skyline doesn't look like this one. What does this look like? Yeah, yep, yeah, this looks like the AP. This looks like the original Defy, so you can't deny that that stupid El Primero they came out with recently looks exactly like a Daytona, and this looks exactly like an AP Royal Oak. Sorry, you made the worst list. Next up, Bulgari and their Octo Finissimo Ultra. I made an episode talking about how this is really cool, how uh, they broke the record, you know, for making the thinnest watch. This is very, very cool. Uh, they put Piaget in their place. And yada, 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 here's the issue with this watch. This QR code, you know what? H. Moser should have been on the best list because they recently came out with a watch that's like full QR code and it's like another F you to the watchmaking world, which is hilarious. But this QR code, when you scan it, what is it? Is it like a personalized thing? Like when you order this hyper expensive watch, you can have a QR code that talks about like you or uh, you can maybe use it as like a company card. Like how cool would it be is like if you ordered this watch, right? And you could get a custom QR code that would be like a business card. So you could be like, and like people would like see your business or see a profile about you or or it, you could use it for like personal marketing or, or business things. Like that would be very, very cool. Or you could just have it where you put it in it like Rick Roll somebody. That would be a hilarious troll. Now, this, when you scan it, it's pretty much just an advertisement for the watch. What the f***? 
work. Like, you have the watch, and then the watchmaker is putting a QR code that, like, advertises more about the watch. That's so dumb. I am not gonna spend much time talking about this, but these have to be on the worst list. The stupid f***ing Omega Moon Swatch. Initially, I was very excited about it. Then it came, became, you know, the, the bane of my existence, everyone. Ugh, it, it, it's all anyone could have ever spoken about this year. It's all anybody wants to talk about. It's a huge joke now when you see one. It just, like, gives me like flashbacks. I feel like I'm a Vietnam War veteran. I'm like traumatized. This watch was, it could have been something so cool, $250 to have a piece of, uh, you know, orological history. If you could, it should have been a more accessible way for a watch enthusiast to have something celebrating a, a true orological icon without spending a ton of money on an actual Omega Speedmaster, because let's face it, not everybody, especially in this economy, can afford an Omega Speedmaster, so this could have been a cool token, essentially, something to, to uh, enjoy and look at and um, just have fun with. But then, like, this became harder to find than an actual Omega Speedmaster, so it kind of defeats the purpose. This has to be on the worst list. F this watch. Okie dokie, remember when I mentioned uh, the tech decks? Um, Patek made a tech deck, okay? So, Gato, throw up the picture of that really, really nice, beautiful Longines. Ooh, nice and smooth, nice asphalt, like, kind of more refined, and, and it looks like it would be... It, just so nice to touch. This looks like a fucking tech deck and I hate it. And it's stupid and dumb and I wish that it would just fucking cease to exist because it sucks. Yes, it has a very nice case back with a micro rotor. Congratulations. I would wear this. If, if someone gave me this watch, I would wear it backwards. I would put the dial up against my wrist and just show the case back off because this fucking watch is so ugly and it looks like a tech deck. Moving on to a watch that doesn't totally piss me off. It's just really, really ugly because the lugs are so freaking wide and the case is bizarre. Longa did another rendition of their sports watch because of course they can't produce multiple sports watches they have to just produce one and then make a bunch of different iterations of it this stupid longa odyssey is i guess now in titanium still oversized lugs with the awkward like stupid lug width and um yes it's titanium which is cool yes it's a longa which is impressive uh nice guilloche pattern you can see here kind of hugging that applied index uh, very, very gorgeous, um, like crazy movement. Absolutely awesome. Horrible, ugly, terrible watch though. And um, I will never put it on the nice list. It's on the naughty list. You are fucked. Oh my God. Funny how things come full circle. The fucking Zenith Daytona. Look at this. This is literally a Daytona. Fuck this watch. This is so stupid. This is a worse Daytona. Do you know how I know? Because the pushers don't thread in and the crown doesn't thread in. So this is just a worse, less functional Daytona. Oh my God, but Zenith makes better watches than Rolex. And the movement's crazy because it's actually uh, really... I don't care. If you're going to get this watch, get a f***ing Daytona. And if you want an El Primero, get one of the other El Primeros that don't look anything like a Daytona. The Chanel 12, it's see-through. More gems, ugly, rubbish. I hate this f***ing watch. They call it the X-Ray Edition. I'm not gonna spend any time on this, but this has to be one of the worst releases. It looks like something you would get out of a coin machine. Boy, is that ugly. That is f***ing atrocious. I made an episode talking about these watches. This is also obviously on the worst list. Uh, the Seiko 5 GMT. People got upset that I said that this is not a true GMT. It's what's known as a color GMT. People said, how dare I say this isn't a true GMT. It is a GMT just like any other GMT. And then I had to make another episode explaining to you, I did not make those terms. There are actual designations when it comes to the nuances and, and the functions of watch movements, like mechanically speaking. This is what's known as a collar, not as in like a shirt collar, but as like a, a beep boop, beep beep boop, beep boop. Collar GMT, and I know Gato, every time we do an episode talking about true type versus collar, he always writes color, like like the color of a rainbow. 
caller. Like, I am a caller. I'm calling you. This is not a true type. There are true type GMTs where the hour hand can jump independently of the handset. And then there are caller type GMTs where the hour hand does not do that, but the GMT hand moves separately. I'm not here to argue which one is better. I know which one is typically more desirable, the true type GMT, like my Rolex Explorer 2, 16570. <laughs> but caller type GMTs are perfectly fine. Why is this on the worst list? Because I know it's going to piss you off, but also because this Seiko 5 took the place of a Seiko SKX. They neutered it. They gave it a non-threaded crown, a 100 meter water resistance rating. This is a rubbish piece of shit neutered version of a Seiko SKX, and this f***ing sucks. Get it out of my face, Gato. And last but not least, Richard Meal had to make the list with the stupid emoji watch. Uh, first time I saw this, I thought that this was a dildo. Still could be. I think it might be a cactus, but I'm not totally sure. You know what? This also looks like a sex toy, I feel like. Um, Richard Meal has made some inappropriate sex watches, though, so we're just gonna call this the emoji dildo watch. Hate it. Uh, don't want to see it. This is absolutely the worst. So there you have it, guys. Best and worst of 2022. What do you think? What would you add on the list for both sides? What's your favorite release of the year? And what's your least favorite release of the year? And do you agree with, with my assessment? Or do you think I was off base? You can let me know in the comment section. And I will catch you on the next one. Hey guys, check it out. We have some new series going on at T3 Time to Drive where I may or may not have purchased another car. <laughs> I'm irresponsible. My dad has new content on his channel, The Beverly Hills Shrink, where he talks about true crime and other issues uh, pertaining to ADHD and depression and medication. He's this super genius mega mind. I'm just the boss baby. We're coming out with more podcasts. Again, we were kind of, we've been kind of slow with the podcast, but uh, don't worry, there are more podcasts coming out and there's more watches and merchandise at the Time Teller shop. So there's a whole bunch going on here at the Time Teller brand. And I want to thank you for hanging out with me and making it work. I will catch you on the next one, guys. I love each and every one of you. Stay happy, stay healthy, stay blessed. I'm Jory Goodman, the Time Teller. And always remember, I didn't invent time. I just tell it. Yeah, yeah.